for joining us. We'll see you back here at 6. From ABC, this is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Reporting tonight from Havana, Cuba. Good evening. Here in Havana today, the Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev has spent a little time in the Caribbean sunlight and shed a little light on what he and the Cuban leader Fidel Castro have been negotiating about. Safe to say the Soviet leader is not here just 90 miles from the U.S. mainland to simply show the flag. As old hat as it seems to some, to look out across the Caribbean here is to realize there doesn't seem to be all that much water between two nations which have been antagonists for so long. But these are interesting times, and that is one of the reasons Mr. Gorbachev is here. ABC's Jim Laurie came from Moscow with him. It was a day for Mikhail Gorbachev to pay his respects. First, with Castro at his side, at the monument to Jose Marti, the 19th century revolutionary who fought the Spanish for Cuban independence. Then walking to his first round of talks, trying to pay his respects to reporters. But when the topic turned to perestroika, Moscow's economic reforms, which Cuba does not embrace, Castro interrupted and moved them on. But in the talks, the tone, as far as we've been told, was respectful. Gorbachev briefed Castro on the Soviets' recent elections. Unlike Gorbachev, Castro has not got around to giving his people a political choice. Castro expressed his concerns about Latin American debt. Both parties agreed the Bush administration should reappraise its refusal to normalize relations with Cuba. We have the feeling here in Havana and in Moscow, the feeling that uh, this administration mis misrepresents the situation in Central America and the role Cuba is ready to play. Later in the day, a visit to a project built with the help of Soviet money. Expo Cuba, a multi-million dollar tribute to the history of socialist achievements. Gorbachev gave it a thumbs up. Whether Mr. Gorbachev makes much history here may be decided tomorrow. Then he'll put forward his ideas on third world debt and announce what one top Soviet official called an important new initiative on Latin America. Peter? Jim, most of the analysts who've studied Fidel Castro over all these years find him more on the defensive than the usual. For one thing, Mr. Gorbachev has considerable entree to Latin America without him. And the changing nature of military technology not to mention the political zone between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, has made Cuba less of a strategic asset than it's been in the past. And so President Castro must convince Mr. Gorbachev that he is still worth all that expensive Soviet support. The other night here in Havana, we stumbled on a small example of how times have changed. The Soviets have offered to sell us video of Soviet military equipment as it is used by the Cubans. When we looked at it, we were reminded of the past. Here's ABC's Richard Threlkeld. Here among the scrub brush and the cattle, the first look we've ever had at the cause of the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, the closest the U.S. and Soviet Union have ever come to nuclear war. The aerial photos were the closest look we could get back then of the Soviet nuclear missiles pointed at the U.S. mainland. This is all that's left now after Khrushchev eventually backed down, removed the missiles, and destroyed the bunkers. The missiles are gone, but in the decades since, the Cuban military has received billions of dollars in Soviet military equipment. But these days, Cuba doesn't count for nearly as much in the Soviet military scheme of things, and these pictures seem to show it. Much of the equipment, at least that shown to us, is old and obsolete. Although with its militia, the Cuban armed forces are the largest in Latin America, this Soviet weaponry is years behind the times. 28 years ago, the Russians almost went to war over Cuba. Today, on the list of Moscow's military priorities, Cuba's only an also ran. Richard Threlkeld, ABC News, Havana. And these days, there was a Cuban connection to South Africa. Cuban soldiers have been returning home over the weekend from Angola, where they played a significant role in forcing South Africa to grant Namibia's independence. However, only a couple of days after the U.N. administrator showed up, the U.N. administered plan for independence is in serious trouble. ABC's Richard Sergei is in Namibia today. Namibia's northern border has turned into a killing field. These rebels belonging to SWAPO, the Southwest African People's Organization, were hunted down today by local government troops led by white South Africans. The SWAPO rebels who came from Angola were heavily armed apparently violating the United Nations ceasefire agreement. Mortis, boosters, 
South Africa warns that fighting threatens the entire peace initiative. Yes, it is certainly in jeopardy. Unless we can contain this, these incursions... The UN is here to oversee Namibia's independence from 74 years of South African rule. Under the first stage of the plan, Swapo guerrillas were to stay in their bases in neighboring Angola. South African troops were to be confined to their bases inside Namibia. Instead, some Swapo forces crossed the border, and the UN had little choice but to allow South Africa to pursue them. We are just going with uh, one aim, and uh, the aim is just to kill. The South Africans claimed the guerrillas miscalculated or didn't understand the UN agreement. Captured Swapo soldiers say they were just trying to go home. Only three days after raising its flag in Namibia, the UN is desperately trying to keep the independence process from unraveling any further. Richard Sergei, ABC News, Windhoek, Namibia. Barry Serafin will have the rest of the day's news from New York in just a moment, including the latest on the oil spill in Alaska. And later in our broadcast from Havana, what the Cuban Revolution has to say for itself as it enters its fourth decade. We'll also have a report on the Cuban government selling the sun to support its revolution. This is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings in Havana. Brought to you by Citicorp. On your path to success, reach for America's strongest financial helping hand, Citicorp and Citibank. More American families own their own homes and attend college with our help. And more get what they want with MasterCard and Visa cards from Citibank than from any other company. We also serve millions of customers in every major marketplace worldwide. Citicorp. Because Americans want to succeed, not just survive. that sticks to the road, not to the rules. Because it assigns power to whatever wheels need it, whenever they need it. Ample reward for resisting the commonplace and taking the alternate route. Transportation officials announced new security measures today for major U.S. and foreign airports. According to the Transportation Secretary, Samuel Skinner, Airlines will be required to install new devices to detect plastic explosives. He also says airlines will now be required to comply with recommendations in FAA security bulletins, which warn about possible threats. In the past, compliance has generally been voluntary. There was more bad news today for Alaskan fishermen in the wake of that huge oil spill. The herring season, worth $12 million to local fishermen, has been canceled. The oil slick has now grown to more than 1,000 square miles, an area bigger than the state of Rhode Island. The latest from ABC's Gary Shepard. As the massive oil spill continued to spread through Prince William Sound, Exxon Corporation issued a public apology today, running full-page ads in the New York Times and other newspapers saying it is sorry the disaster occurred and promising to meet its obligations to clean it up. And we intend to leave Prince William Sound uh, as close to what it was before the, uh, the tragedy. It's going to be an extraordinarily difficult job. Cleanup operations are underway on some of the 800 miles of shoreline already covered with oil. Some crews are literally on their knees using absorbent towels to remove the oil from rocky beaches. At Sawmill Bay, at least a hundred people and several dozen boats are working frantically to keep the oil from reaching the Port San Juan salmon hatchery. Thousands of feet of oil boom is being put in the water there. Nearly all of the oil that remained on board the Valdez has now been removed, and that job should be completed tomorrow morning. Meanwhile, the crude oil terminal here resumed full operation today, filling up empty tankers that have been waiting to carry it to the lower 48. The latest estimate is the cleanup will easily take at least six months, probably a lot longer. Gary Shepard, ABC News, Valdez, Alaska. There was a hint from President Bush today of a new administration position on a peace settlement for the Middle East. It came during a meeting with the President of Egypt, Hosni Mubarak. ABC's Britt Hume is at the White House. After an hour meeting with Mubarak, Mr. Bush and his guest exchanged the usual flowery statements. But almost in passing, President Bush said something no U.S. president had ever said. Egypt and the United States 
share the goals of security for Israel, the end of the occupation, and achievement of Palestinian political rights. It's the part about ending the Israeli occupation that's new. It is something the Israelis have steadfastly resisted and the U.S. has always treated with great caution. Mubarak was understandably eager to encourage the current U.S. peace efforts. In short, the situation is right for an active effort more than ever before. This meeting produced a classic blend of the substance and ceremony which is the presidency in a TV age. During a photo opportunity, Mubarak, who would later attend the opening day of baseball in Baltimore with his host, said he'd never seen a game except on TV, but... I know that President Bush was a captain of a team. And a short time later, wearing the first baseman's mitt he wore as Yale's captain, Mr. Bush took the mound in Baltimore. Later, seated in his box, the president asked how it had gone. Hi, and outside. The Mubarak visit is this week's easy part, even letting the president show his skill at baseball. When Israeli Prime Minister Shamir arrives Thursday, we'll see how Mr. Bush does at hardball. Brit Hume, ABC News, the White House. And one other baseball note, it was a particularly sweet opening day for Pete Rose, the Cincinnati Reds manager, subject of an investigation by the baseball commissioner's office into gambling charges, got a standing ovation from 50,000 hometown fans at today's win over the Los Angeles Dodgers. Peter? Barry, after 30 years, the Cubans will not allow any serious debate about their revolution here. We'll have a report on their progress when we come back as our broadcast continues from Havana. On the subject of baseball, Cubans love it and play it well. But gone are the days when a Cuban could aspire to play for the Yankees. The Cuban government would discourage a ball player playing for the enemy. The U.S. wouldn't let him in anyway. It's deer season. Time to drive a bargain with your John Deere dealer. Now you can get $100 to $300 off on riders and tractors. Or choose accessories at no extra cost. But hurry, deer season ends May 31st. See your John Deere dealer and drive home a bargain. Sure, I want my vitamins, but I don't want to be here all morning. One glass of great-tasting sun-sweet prune juice gives me more iron and calcium than those other juices. Sun-sweet, here's to your health. We're here at the new Disney MGM Studios theme park for the premiere of the 1990 Chevy Lumina. The Lumina sedan has the most passenger room in its class. And coming later this year, the Lumina Coupe and the new Lumina all-purpose vehicle with optional seating for seven, no matter what your size. Introducing the family Lumina from today's Chevrolet. The heartbeat of America. That's today's Chevrolet. Chevy Lumina, official car of the Disney MGM Studios theme park. See you real soon. Are you getting something extra in your high-fiber cereal, like sodium and added sugar? Fiber One is low in sodium and has no added sugar. So get more of the fiber your body needs and less of the stuff it doesn't. Get Fiber One. Mikhail Gorbachev has never been to Cuba. In fact, this is only the second time since the Cuban Revolution began that a Soviet leader has come here. The Gorbachev's advisors have surely told him that in those 30 years, this island has been transformed. Castro has delivered the most to those who have the least. And for much of the third world, Cuba is actually a model of development. Education was once available to the rich and the well-connected. It is now free to all. On January the 1st, 1959, when the Cuban dictator Batista left the country for good, only a third of the population could read and write. Today, the literacy rate is 97%. Medical care was once for the privileged few. Today, it is available to every Cuban, and it is free. Some of Cuba's health care is world-class, in heart disease, for example, in brain surgery. Health and education are the revolution's great success stories. And this is the, are the most important, the two most important things that a people can, can expect from a government, and we have the both of them. And housing is better, too, though there isn't enough of it. 
the acres of slums that were once the belt of poverty around Havana are gone. The revolution nationalized all apartments and decreed that rents may be no more than 10% of income. But three generations of one family are often obliged to share the same space. There is so little privacy. There's lots of work to do. To be alone, we must go for ice cream or to the movies. Castro has promised to build a million new apartments in 10 years, but it is very much overdue. And in a city which has some of the most beautiful architecture in the Caribbean, there are no resources to save some of the older buildings. Like fading dowagers, they are slowly falling apart. The really hard part for Cubans is not knowing when they will be able to stop making sacrifices. When the dream of a prosperous and diversified economy will come true. Twenty years ago, only a handful of foreign correspondents were allowed to come and report here. Walk down any country road in Cuba, drive down any highway, and this is what you'll see. Cuba's lifeblood, sugarcane. Today, sugar is still Cuba's lifeblood. In 1989, sugar represents 75% of everything that Cuba exports to the rest of the world. But despite all the promises about economic growth, if people would work hard in the sugar fields, the Cuban economy today is actually shrinking. The Cubans experimented with Soviet-style reforms a couple of years ago, but when some Cubans made a lot of money from even limited private enterprise, Castro found it unacceptable. Thirty years after the revolution began, Cubans make other sacrifices. Cubans may gripe about their lot in life, but there is no true freedom of speech, no freedom of the press. There is still only the Communist Party, and while a handful of dissidents is tolerated, especially with the international news media in town, they may still be swept up without charge for trying to speak their mind. The Cuban record on human rights is not as bad as it once was, but there are still several hundred political prisoners. Freedom of religion is more complicated. Mass is often well attended. But Father Lopez told us he would never confront the authorities directly. Better, he said, to use the gospel as a comparison to communism. There is no question in Cuba today that the church as an institution knows its place. Everything we can do on the church, in the church, not on the street. And finally, the revolution and perspective. When a visitor looks at the 1950 vintage American cars teetering along, there is an easy temptation to compare what is happening here with what Cubans have in America. In so many ways, it is an unfavorable comparison. But many Cubans compare themselves instead with some of their other neighbors. Haiti, Chile, El Salvador, Mexico. If you think of Cuba in comparison with, with the rest of Latin America, you'll find a very sound, healthy society. And whatever the mistakes of this revolution, Cubans tend to blame the Communist Party or the bureaucrats. Rarely do they blame Castro. For me, he is God. I love him very much. Barry Serafin will have more news from home in just a moment. And we'll be back with a final note from here in Cuba as our broadcast from Havana continues. This is the only island in the world where both the United States and the Soviets have major military bases. The U.S. Navy base at Guantanamo Bay is the oldest U.S. base on foreign soil. And it's the only one in a communist nation. By treaty, it will stay here as long as the U.S. wishes. The most powerful engine in its class. Four doors, room for five. Available four-wheel anti-lock brakes. We've done our part in separating Jeep Cherokee from everything else. Now it's your turn. Zero percent financing or 500 cash back, plus up to $1,100 off option packages on select Cherokees. If you're a business spending over $120 a month in long distance services, and you think that you're saving 20 to 30% with another carrier, we want you to try AT&T Pro Watts. We'll waive the installation charges, waive the change charges, and if you're not satisfied and agree that we have the best value, price, and quality, 
the end of 90 days, we'll pay to put you back on your other long distance vendor. You can save 10 to 38% on AT&T long distance. Call us, 1-800-222-0400. I carry keys, I carry lipstick, I carry Metaprint, because you never know what you might need. Hey, Metaprint. Oh, I had this real bad backache, and uh, I asked the doctor, he said, take Metaprint. Well, I don't like taking pain relievers, but sometimes you need them, and, and Metaprint works great for me. Metaprint's made for tough pain. Because it's made with ibuprofen, the same medicine as in Motrin, and nothing's proven faster. It really helps with arthritis. If I get a headache, it's Metaprint for me. <laughs> I bet they could use a Metaprint. When the pain gets tough, get Metaprin. We know what your home is really worth. When it comes time to buy or sell, no one knows more or cares more about the American home than better homes and gardens. Quaker State Engines don't know when to quit. Quaker State Engines run strong and run long because Quaker State exceeds every single car maker's U.S. requirements for maximum engine protection. The big Q stands for quality. The San Diego Yacht Club announced today that it's going back to court to try to win back the America's Cup. The New York State Supreme Court had ruled that San Diego had won the cup unfairly and had to forfeit it to New Zealand. In Seattle tonight, two unlikely candidates meet each other for the NCAA College Basketball Championship. ABC's Dick Schaap reports. The odds were a million to one against their getting to the title game. Not the surprising Pirates of Seton Hall, nor the upstart Wolverines of Michigan. Their coaches, P.J. Carlesimo of Seton Hall, who almost lost his head coaching job a year ago. And Steve Fisher of Michigan, who didn't have a head coaching job a month ago. Fisher was then an assistant to Bill Frieder, who on the brink of the NCAA tournament accepted a lucrative new job at Arizona State. Michigan promptly named Fisher head coach, but only on an interim basis. Since then, Michigan has won five straight games, a coach's dream. It sure is. And don't wake me up till Tuesday morning. Carlesimo survived several nightmare seasons at Seton Hall. The student newspaper called for his head last year, and his rival coaches picked him to finish seventh in the Big East this season. I think you've got to understand that the intelligence factor of the other eight coaches in our league is not terribly high to begin with. Carlesimo can joke. With gifted players and two strong seasons behind him, his job is now secure. Fisher, never a head coach before, doesn't know if he'll have the Michigan job after tonight. I'm hopeful that I'll be there, but I have no control over that. And I've never heard of an undefeated coach getting fired, so... <laughs> <laughs> if he wins tonight and gets the job, Steve Fisher will jump even higher. Dick Schapp, ABC News, Seattle. Now, Peter Jennings is standing by once again in Havana. Peter? Thanks, Barry. We'll have a final report on how the government here is trying to capitalize, literally, on the weather as our broadcast from Havana continues. Whatever Mrs. Gorbachev does in Cuba, she will be accompanied by Fidel Castro's sister-in-law. Ask a Cuban if Fidel is married, and they simply won't answer or do not know. He and his first wife were divorced, his longtime companion died of cancer. Today, he is a zealot about his privacy. Maybe you can't stop the world in its tracks. But you can take an alternate route in the Audi 200 sedan. It rejects fixed formulas. Instead, its advanced brakes adapt and assign stopping power according to the size of the load. Welcome reassurance for ignoring the ordinary and taking the alternate route. My mama used to scrub all day till our house smelled as fresh as the Carolina pine forest. I don't have all day, so I use Lysol Pine Action. The dual action top squeezes for small spaces, dilutes for big jobs. So this whole house feels like home. Lysol Pine Action, the clean of pine in less time. New Light Scent Love My Carpet. The light scent not to be made light of. It's tougher on tough carpet odors than Arm & Hammer Light. Light Scent Love My Carpet. Delightful. Introducing Total Raisin Bran. Other raisin brands have only one-fourth as much vitamin nutrition. And eating a raisin bran with only one-fourth the vitamin nutrition you could get 
is like having Mount Rushmore. Hey. With only one precedent. New Total Raisin Bran is the only raisin bran with 100% of 11 vitamins and minerals. Total Nutrition has finally come to Raisin Bran. Tonight on Nightline, Gorbachev in Cuba. Should the U.S. be worried or pleased? We'll go live to Havana to talk with top Cuban and Soviet officials tonight. And finally tonight, from where we are here on the northern boundary of the Caribbean, it is the latest message from Fidel Castro to foreigners. Come and spend your next vacation here. As Cuban industry and Cuban farming have once again fallen on slack times, the Cuban government has decided that more must be done to take advantage of their island in the sun. The ads on hotel television beckon to foreigners. Come back. Spend your money. We have to put ourselves into the tourist business in a big way in order to save our economy. The Monte Carlo of the Americas. Before the revolution in 1959, Cuba was a tourist mecca. Nightclubs and gambling in the warm Caribbean sun attracted 350,000 tourists here a year mostly Americans then. Fidel Castro put an end to that capitalist decadence. After the revolution, for the first time in many cases, Cubans from all walks of life were allowed to go to the beaches. But it was only at the beginning of the 1980s that Castro decided the beaches could be profitable again. And as new hotels begin to reach for the blue skies, the tourists are coming back. Last year, 200,000 tourists, mostly from Canada, West Germany, and elsewhere in Latin America, deposited $120 million in hard currency on this island. It was a good deal for them, too. This Caribbean island is for German, for example, is uh, not, so, um, expensive. not so expensive like Bahamas, for example. By 1991, Cuba hopes to attract 600,000 visitors annually and $500 million in the standard tourist currency, American dollars. Not that the Cubans are that particular. Mark, francs, pounds, dollars, Canadian dollars. These beachfront villas were once owned by the rich and powerful. They were allowed to go to seed by the Cuban government of Fidel Castro. Today, however, with paint and polish, they are turning a profit which suits these Cuban Marxists very well. We are not uh, changing our system, and we don't need to change our system. And Fidel agrees, exploit the sun, he says. An idea from before his revolution, which is in vogue again. Tourism is so important to Cuba's economic future that it's the only segment of the economy in which workers can be fired for inefficiency. And what Cubans really regret is that no Americans can come and spend their dollars here. It is against American law. That's our report on World News tonight. We'll be here again tomorrow. I'm Peter Jennings. Good night from Havana.